Welcome to ESIP 101. I am Susan Chingledecker, Executive Director of ESIP, Earth Science Information Partners. Our aim today is to give you a fast paced overview of who ESIP is, what we have to offer, and how you can connect and participate with us. ESIP is a large community of professionals whose knowledge and experience spans a broad range of technical and domain specific expertise. The breadth and depth of our community can be a lot to take in. But it is my hope that once you dive in, you will find ESIP is a friendly and welcoming place. And our team wants to do everything we can to ensure that. So who is ESIP? As a community, we believe that our quality of life, economic opportunities, and the stewardship of our planet is enhanced by the regular use of scientifically sound earth science data and information provided in a timely manner by a collaborative community that is working together to continually improve our services and innovate. To me, the challenges we face in 2022 are so great. We know that data is at the heart of understanding and overcoming these challenges. As a community, we want to ensure that earth science data is used most effectively, most efficiently, and that it is available to all who need it. We believe that no one person can solve these challenges alone, but that by working together in a collaborative, coordinated fashion and putting data at the center, we can solve some of the world's greatest problems. ESIP helps members of the Earth Science Data community find each other across organizations by fostering rich collaborative experiences through twice annual meetings, monthly telecons, workshops, and ESIP lab seed funding to further innovation in data management. I like to think of ESIP as a brain trust of earth science data professionals. We represent individuals and organizations across the data life cycle, from users to application tool and system developers, data providers, and archivists. We are interdisciplinary and cross multiple sectors and scientific domains. Especially exciting to me, is that the ESIP community bridges academia, the private sector, and multiple state and federal agencies. We provide that place where all of these people can come together. We are fortunate to have long-standing federal support in the form of cooperative agreements with NASA, NOAA, and USGS. We are proud to be a place where these federal agencies can come together to collaborate. Key to ESIP's success is our diversity of partners and perspectives. Within ESIP, we have five primary partner types, as you can see here. Our aim is to have participation and representation in ESIP as a whole and across our committees from partners active in all parts of the data life cycle. ESIP brings together organizations of partners and individual volunteers can participate regardless of whether or not they are affiliated with an ESIP partner organization. But ask yourself, is your organization or institution an ESIP partner? We would love to discuss where you fit in and see you as a full partner within ESIP. Underlying ESIP's work in our community are our core values. For over 20 years, the ESIP community has committed to these values. Have you ever faced a challenge in your work that you felt you had to overcome alone? Have you thought to yourself, you can't be the only one struggling with a problem? ESIP is that place where some of our brightest minds in earth science data management come in a collegial, collaborative, neutral, and open way to tackle these types of challenges together. ESIP is a non-competitive space powered by a spirit of collaboration around data management and data stewardship. To ensure these values, the ESIP community has adopted community participation guidelines that detail expected and unacceptable behaviors within the community. While we talk a lot about data, it is people who are the heart of ESIP. We are led by our board and program committee. This is a group of leaders elected each year at our annual assembly meeting in January. Our board consists of the president, vice president, and our administrative committee chairs in the green box, plus our three at-large board members in yellow. They meet quarterly. Our program committee consists of the president, vice president, plus our administrative and technical committee chairs seen here in the green and blue boxes. They meet monthly. Volunteers and voluntary leadership are essential to ESIP's success 
and I am grateful to these leaders for their time and guidance. Another group of individuals you will come to know are the ESIP Community Fellows. Our Community Fellows are current graduate students or recent postdocs who engage with ESIP in more deep ways and are assigned to support specific collaboration areas. They bring their current research interests to the community, they help manage the activity of the area they are assigned, and they support the hosting of our two large community meetings each year. We see the Community Fellows Program as a great way to connect with and invest in early career professionals and expose them to the work of community management. We have seen many Community Fellows benefit from the networking they found at ESIP and have many have gone on to be some of ESIP's most active community members throughout their careers. Backing up this community of volunteers is the incredible ESIP staff. Please allow me to introduce the ESIP team. Annie Burgess is the ESIP Lab Director in Bozeman, Montana. Megan Carter is our Community Director in Nyack, New York. Patty Allen is our Operations Director in Manassas, Virginia. Allison Mills is the ESIP Communications Manager in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And Lindsay Barbieri is our Agriculture and Climate Fellow in Burlington, Vermont. Each member of the team brings unique skills to the organization. The work of community building and virtual collaboration takes a ton of behind the scenes effort. It is my hope that as you engage with ESIP, you will get to know our team well. Please feel free to reach out to us anytime with questions. Core to our work and who we are is providing the collaborative infrastructure, the backbone support that helps to lower barriers to collaboration. ESIP has been using many of these tools for years before online collaboration became a necessity. This infrastructure helps us to remove geographic, financial, and other hurdles and form support platforms to enable your work. We want to provide the ESIP community with the latest tools and platforms to support your goals. What the community does with this technology is up to you. The collaborative infrastructure isn't static. It evolves daily, especially in a COVID-19 world, and our team stays on top of the latest trends and innovations in collaboration tools. ESIP focuses on three primary approaches to support the community, foster innovation, and encourage collaboration, virtual collaboration, meetings, and the ESIP lab. From here, I'm going to hand things off to the ESIP team to go into greater depth on each of these. Megan will cover our virtual collaboration work that is active 365 days a year, in between our two large and visible meetings. Annie will share how the ESIP lab provides a mechanism for prototyping, experimentation, and skill development, as well as our meetings. So turn it over to you, Megan. Thank you so much, you so Susan. Much. So in my role as community director, I support the work of ESIP's approximately 30 themed collaboration areas. And these are groups that meet uh, regularly, typically monthly. Sometimes uh, they're more ambitious and even meet twice a month around earth science data related challenges or opportunities. You can see the list of currently active groups on the screen and you'll notice that they span a wide range of topics from the more technical areas like cloud computing and machine learning to the more application areas like agriculture and climate and disasters. And most of these groups, uh, particularly the clusters listed on the right are fairly informal in nature. So they're proposed when there's a need to get work done and they spin down once that work is done. Of course, should a need arise in that same area again, they can always reemerge. But this is the way that we make space for new and emerging topics and kind of stay on the on the cutting edge of what people are interested in with respect to earth science data. So uh, the goals and format of each collaboration area, they're dicta dictated, excuse me, by the participants, and they can vary a lot. So some host webinar series like the ITNI technology dive that happens monthly. Some others develop guidelines. Um, the data citation guidelines are one of the most uh, more uh, well known outputs of an ESIP cluster. Others simply find it valuable to get together and have an hour of open discussion once a month together. Many of these groups plan and convene sessions at ESIP's twice annual meetings. And as I mentioned, these groups are open and free to join. There's no RSVP necessary. You can simply view our telecon calendar at esipfed.org slash telecons and hop on any call that interests you. Once you do, I always recommend that you share uh, what your challenges and opportunities are 
what you care about in your day job because we want these collaborations to be relevant and helpful for you. So it's great if you share what your challenges are and what would keep you coming back to the next telecon. So um, here are a few examples. I wanna make this really, um, really clear about what some of the collaboration areas are working on right now. I obviously don't have time to take you through all 30, but let's just give you a bit of a flavor. So the scienceonschema.org cluster is compiling a set of guidelines to help data repositories and other content providers adopt the schema.org vocabulary for publishing metadata about data resources. And the broader goal here is to make it easier for others to provide consistent machine actionable metadata using web publishing standards so that scientific data sets are more easily discovered across the web. Another example, the Data Stewardship Committee is currently updating a series of educational modules on research data management for research scientists. Um, these are data stewardship related topics and they're known as the ESIP Data Management Short Course. So again, ESIP wants to stay on the cutting edge of what's the best advice that's out there right now and how can we help scientists to know about it. Another example, through the use of a survey and more, ESIP's data readiness cluster is working toward defining a community standard for AI ready data, including defining the factors that are most important for AI readiness, specifically for open data sets. The biological data standards cluster just published the first version of a primer aimed at helping data managers who are new to biological observation data standards to select a standard that best meets the goals for the data they're managing. It's called the Biological Observation Data Standardization, a primer for data managers. So we hope this is a very useful, tangible document people can take and use in their day jobs. The Physical Sample Curation Cluster is developing journal guidance for physical samples and associated data in its regular meetings. Um, this is modeled after similar guidance that already exists for data. Finally, I'd like to mention the Agriculture and Climate Cluster, which has been spearheading a cross collaboration area effort that includes more than five other ESIP groups and has brought in numerous subject matter experts to explore the topic of wildfire, including the challenge of ingesting heterogeneous data from in situ and remotely sensed systems into models and applications between the pre fire and fire containment phases. The Disasters Cluster is also very interested in this topic, particularly from the angle what does it really mean to trust data and how can we empower non-experts and local decision makers to both discover and use data to make more rapid decisions so that was a very small sampling of what ESIP collaboration areas do but you can see the topical diversity and how active this community is and we really hope that you'll want to get involved so beyond the regular telecoms and the ESIP uh, twice annual meetings, I wanna tell you about another activity where we showcase some of the work of our collaboration areas, ESIP lab projects and ESIP partner organizations. It's called the Data Help Desk. And the goal of this event is to provide researchers with opportunities to engage with informatics experts who are familiar with their scientific domain. And again, kind of like the data management training short course that I mentioned in the last slide, to help them to learn about skills and techniques that will help them to further their research and to make their data and software more open and fair, where fair is an acronym that means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And in the past, these events have taken place at as exhibit booths at scientific meetings. So you see a couple of pictures here from those. The first one was held at the AGU fall meeting in 2017, in case you're wondering. But along with our partners, we have also successfully hosted data help desk in conjunction with five other professional meetings for a total of over 15 events so far. And we've done this not only in the in-person world, but we've taken it online and we've, we've also run a, a hybrid iteration as well. So if you have expertise you would like to share as part of a future event, please reach out to me. Um, there's even a virtual data help desk coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. So these are happening all the time. Uh, I will now pass it off to my colleague, Annie Burgess, to tell you more about the ESIP Lab. Thanks, Megan, and uh, lovely to meet all of you watching here today. Um, the ESIP Lab facilitates project-based learning opportunities for Earth scientists to increase their technical savvy while increasing our collective knowledge of Earth system science. Uh, I see our activities in the, within the lab as part of a wide array of activities related to how scientists gain knowledge throughout their career, which you can uh, see on this slide here. 
between meetings, collaborations, work time, um, and this notion of project-based learning. So in the case of project-based learning, this is a way to use objectives in your day job as the primary vehicle to drive your learning experience. Over the past two years, this has included supporting numerous individuals across public agencies, experiment with data management and analysis in the cloud. Uh, ESIP has worked closely with both Amazon Web Services, AWS, and Microsoft Azure to secure the resources to support these types of efforts. So around project-based learning, we basically want to break the paradigm that taking time to learn is lost time. Uh, in this very simple idealized chart, we show that continu continuing to work in the way one is accustomed can feel more productive over a short time. But in the long term, it is ultimately less productive than taking some short periods of time to expand your skill set. So basically what I found by guiding over 30 projects through this process is that if we align learning goals with science objectives, the time spent learning those skills isn't perceived as lost time you are ultimately more productive over the long run. Outside of working on project-based learning, uh, the ESIP lab also runs a number of programs uh, to help goals of our federal partners. So as you can see here, uh, I've outlined three specific programs or four specific programs with three of our federal partners. Um, these include the NOAA Cloud Pathfinders program, uh, NASA AIST technical evaluations, NASA ESDSWG uh, committee or the collaboration methods and technology infusion group and a USGS led cloud sandbox using uh, Q hub technology. Um, these all align with goals of the ESIP lab to help facilitate experimentation across both of our, uh, our federal partners and it also enables people within the academic and private sectors to come in and collaborate with our federal partners in various activities. Lastly, uh, outside of ESIP 101, I'd love to talk to others about how uh, you might envision working with the lab. Um, as you can see here, we've we have received a lot of really positive feedback from people that we engage with around their experience working with the lab. Um, and now it has really allowed them to uh, experiment in a productive way within, uh, while still again, um, working towards specific science objectives. So I'd like to pivot away from the lab and talk a little bit about our meetings. Um, meetings are the third area where we help our community connect. They are not traditional uh, by any means, <laughs> um, where you're presented in a passive way in one session after the next. Um, what makes ESIP meetings different is the amount of content that is contributed by the community, uh, the numerous networking opportunities, and our explicit focus on collegial learning environments. These meetings are open to all and typically draw 200 to 500 attendees across the public, private, and academic sectors. And after our meetings, we ask attendees about their experience. Uh, the most frequent response relates to um, the people they met and the collaborations that kicked off while still coming away with greater technical insights. So on the screen now, you can see just a few quotes from past meeting attendees on the value of ESIP meetings to them. Uh, we're really proud that our meeting attendance and participation has grown in this virtual world with a format that is engaging and accessible. ESIP meetings are different. Uh, we want you to show up fully and participate actively, and we love you to find your earth science data home here with ESIP. And I will pass it back to Susan now. Thanks, Annie. So as you can see, there are a number of ways you can get involved in ESIP. We want ESIP to be the place where you come to discover, innovate, collaborate, and network. You can join one of the collaboration areas that Megan mentioned. You can support the Data Help Desk. You can apply for small grant funding through the ESIP Lab. You can encourage your organization to become an ESIP partner. We encourage you to engage in any and all ways that are productive for you. If you have questions about where you might plug in, please reach out to a member of the ESIP staff. We would be happy to help you engage. I hope you've learned a little bit about ESIP meetings, collaboration areas, and the ESIP Lab. If you take just one action today, 
I would recommend that you sign up for our ESIP update mailing list. The link is on the bottom left here to get a once weekly update on all things in and around ESIP. Finally, I would like to thank everyone for attending today. Now it is my pleasure to share a few insights about next week's meeting to help you get the most of your time with us. The ESIP January meeting will run from Tuesday, January 18th through Friday, January 21st. And to ensure everyone's safety and maximum participation, the meeting will be held online using a combination of virtual platforms. This is not just any virtual meeting. We specifically design ESIP meetings to be engaging. So come prepared to turn on your camera, meet new people, brainstorm new solutions, and engage deeply. Our meetings are not possible without the support of registration and sponsorship. I want to thank AGU and Element 84, two longtime ESIP meeting sponsors. And I especially want to highlight Microsoft, our new premier level meeting sponsor. You can create your own custom meeting schedule in Sketch and see the sessions available. I want to highlight our opening plenary on Tuesday, where we will look to move beyond principles to practice with a great panel discussion about engaging Indigenous communities. This will be followed by eight engaging breakout sessions designed and led by your peers. Wednesday is structured for some longer, more in-depth sessions and will feature our research showcase poster session in the evening. More on that in just a minute. On Thursday, our plenary will feature the dynamic discussion on public-private partnerships with representatives from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as two entrepreneurial and innovative CEOs of private sector technology firms. Friday, we will have our last four breakout sessions and we'll close the meeting with the ESIP annual business meeting, where we will hear more about the state of ESIP updates from the leadership of our federal agency partners, as well as present community awards and select our committee representatives for the coming year. It will be a busy week. The meeting will be held in a platform called Kiko Chat. Here is a preview of what that will look like. On the left is a list of all the sessions in their rooms for a given day. On the right are the collaborative documents used for each session with announcements, a link to submit questions for speakers, or take interactive polls, as well as a link to the SCAD agenda to see speaker bios. Once you choose the room you want to join, just look in the upper left corner and you will see a join video button. This will take you to the Zoom room for each session. If you download Zoom, be sure to have the current version or you can use the browser version. The ESIP team are available in the help desk to answer any questions you may have. A few special opportunities I wanna highlight. The Research Showcase is a virtual gallery of posters and recorded demos and tutorials from the ESIP meeting attendees. The gallery is available throughout the meeting for attendees to view. We will also have a live event on Wednesday evening that features a fun, fast-paced format. Outside of this time, you can also contact presenters to find a time to meet up with them in their individual Zoom rooms associated with their presentation. We have found that the research showcase was one of the elements of an in-person meeting that translated best to the virtual world. Not to brag, but we've been told that we have some of the best online poster sessions. So I hope to see you there. Don't miss this chance to meet others, learn about their research and seed ideas for future collaboration. We have heard that one, of, one part of in-person meetings that has been hardest to replicate in a virtual setting is casual networking. We are committed to continued experimentation to enable you to meet new colleagues and reconnect with those you haven't seen in a while. We try to provide ample breaks throughout the day. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will have dedicated networking coffee breaks. And on Monday evening, the meetings committee will host a happy hour. For these events, we will utilize a spatial chat tool called Wonder that allows you to talk to people whose icons are close to yours on screen. This enables multiple small conversations to happen simultaneously and allows you to move around the room and talk with different groups of people. As you can see here on screen, there are 12 separate small group conversations happening at the same time. And you can just drag your circle to move around the room to choose, the, to choose and join the conversation of your choice. Lastly, while you are building your calendar for the ESIP meeting, don't worry if you can't make it for all the sessions you would like. All the sessions are recorded 
and the ESIP Meeting Highlights webinar is a great way for you to catch up on fast-paced lightning talks about what happened at most sessions and how to get involved in next steps. We will record this webinar and share it on our YouTube channel. I know we have covered a ton. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Our team is here to answer any questions you may have. So please feel free to reach out anytime. We're here to help.